Hey, all you cats and kittens. Sorry, had to. Tiger King was on my mind. Now check out my art. It's pretty bad, huh? I'm going to get to that in a little bit, but I'm going to distract it right now. I got some props for today. I got my Chewbacca. My Chewbacca Build-A-Bear. Say hi, Chewie. Arr, 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 arr. That was that was me. That wasn't him. That was me. He's going to help us do some joint motions later on if he's up to it. You don't make a Wookiee uh, do what you want. You can only hope that they comply. All right, so let's get going, shall we? The first thing I want to discuss is um, why understanding global references are important. Because our joint motions are locally referenced, meaning that it's from the perspective of the joints. So then you're like, well, if we're going to learn about joint motions and positions, why do we need to take into account global references? And it's a great question, and the answer is, is to help us to not make mistakes about joint motions. In other words, if you understand global perspectives, it'll help you understand when the body's trying to play tricks on you, okay? So I'll give you an example in a little bit, but globally reference things inside a classroom is super simple, right? The front of class, the back of class, AP axis, side to side, bilateral, up, down, pull. But in the real world, when you're out on a football field, when you're an athletic trainer on a football field or in a clinic or just out at the park, what's the front? What's the back? What's the sides, right? It, in the real world, the, the only real global reference we have at any given time is ground and, and gravity, right? In other words, you can think of the polar axis always being here, but the bilateral and the AP is once you kind of leave a classroom or, or a standard inside, outside, front, back, up, I mean, left, right, kind of irrelevant. But the ground is still important as a global reference. So let me give you an example or try to give you an example of why understanding global references is important, okay? If somebody is assessing someone's range of motion, okay, how, how much motion they have, let's say, in their arm, okay, in their shoulder. If you're looking at the angle change globally, I kind of hinted on it about throwing overhand. That's kind of an illusion. If you say, okay, let's see how much motion you have in your shoulder, and I want to see if you can get the shoulder to move 90 degrees, Okay, so let's say they start to move the shoulder and then all of a sudden they get to a sticking point. And then what they do is they start to lean their trunk and they get the arm to 90 degrees globally. The global change was 90 degrees. My humerus and my radius and my ulna and all my carpal bones that are attached sure did get to 90 degrees. It's hovering parallel to the ground. But that 90 degrees didn't come locally from the shoulder. So by understanding global references, by understanding that locally, this angle is still under 90 degrees at the shoulder, by understanding global references, we will better be able to understand local references, okay? So when you're out in the park, at the field, wherever, a good rule of thumb is that your eyes will always symbolize what's forward and back. Your eyes represent your AP axis, wherever you're looking. Makes sense, because usually where you're looking, that's forward for you. And even the opposite of that, going back. So, so the sagittal plane kind of follows your nose. There's an old commercial, follow your nose, it's always nose. It's a Fruit Loops commercial. Back in my day, so when you don't really know what front and back is globally, at least you understand that the ground is a global transverse plane. 
and your eyes, therefore, will kind of be your basis for the sagittal plane. But again, even if your eyes are here and your eyes see sagittal and your eyes see frontal, that doesn't mean your joints, your wrists, your elbows, your hips. Everybody could be seeing all kinds of funky things, and that's okay. As long as we understand that references, like local references, are relative. They're relative to which part we're talking about, okay? So that's important. Why do we bother with global references is so that we can understand when things may not look what they appear. And your body does that all the time. We cheat. We are excellent cheaters at motion. Anybody ever seen the, the people at the gym? Maybe It's usually the old people, bless their hearts. But sometimes it could be young people who are trying to maybe do curls with too much weight. And they do this. And their, their elbows don't move. Globally, they're getting the, the dumbbell from here up there. So by using a global reference, they're doing great. But someone educated in kinesiology like yourself who understands that joint motions are relative, you could say that was an awesome display of isometric contraction with no motion involved at the elbows. But, but again, it, you could see how it could be tricky unless you know what you're looking for, okay? So we have to understand global references for, to better understand local references, okay? The next thing I want to talk to you guys about is the little anatomical positional little man that we have, okay? This guy. This guy is in your book and he kind of looks like that. And I want to explain why this guy and those planes and axes that you traditionally see can be confusing because there's no context to those pictures. It's just uh, sagittal, uh, frontal, transverse. And usually it'll be thrown in with um, the sagittal plane uh, separates you into right and left halves. That, that has no context whatsoever. The frontal plane separates you from front and back. Again, no context, transverse up and down. What this means in terms of our class and, and, and rotation. Well, first of all, let me tell you why this could be confusing. Objects rotate in planes. They have to rotate. Objects do not translate in planes. We have dimensions for translatory motion. X, Y, and Z, right? Up, down, front, back, left, right. Plane is specifically for spin. This is a still picture. That's a fixed picture. There's no spinning happening there. So we have to infer spin. How does this person spin in a transverse plane? He got to start spinning. So you can almost look at that transverse plane as kind of like a, a, you know, a, a CD or, or a, 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 an album, an LP. He's got to spin. He's got to spin. Now, you may say, well, what's the deal with the, with the separate you? Because if you're going to spin your whole body and not spin joints, but spin your whole body, you're going to spin about your center of mass. Uh, uh, you have to. If you were just Harry Potter stuff and floating in the air and you started spinning in your transverse plane, you are going to spin about your center of mass. And your center of mass in the transverse plane literally is going to separate you in the top and bottom because that's what your center of mass is. It's the center of where all the stuff is distributed. You can look at this another way, a more kind of morbid way. But if something like, like uh, the movie Saw, if Saw was this, this spinning hacksaw, not a hacksaw, but just a spinning skill saw, and it spun and sliced you through your center of mass, then it would separate you in the top and bottom halves. But there has to be spin. There has to be spin. Same thing with sagittal. If you really want to look at sagittal plane rotation, you got to spin the dude. 
about his center of mass. And then that center of mass, as he's spinning, then you can look at it as the center of mass is separating right and left. But you got to spin the dude. And again, in Saul, if he took something that spun in the sagittal plane through his center of mass, he would slice through and separate in the front to right and left halves. Same thing for the frontal. Split you through your center of mass, you're going to separate in the front and back. We will not do that. But the point is, is that the reason that picture can be super confusing is that it doesn't give context to spin. Some pictures do, like uh, this one was kind of cool. Uh, there's some uh, mechanical terms, uh, pitch, roll, and yaw. That's nothing but sagittal, frontal, and transverse. It's a, it's a fancy way of saying that. But this picture gives the rotation. I dig it because it gives context. It's like, yeah, yeah, those are your planes. Check out your axes. And to give context into rotating in the planes, you got to spin. You got to spin. Transverse, frontal, sagittal. So something like this is a cool resource because it gives the concept of spin, all right? So the reason it could be less clear, sorry, I did my less clear dance, is when you see a picture of a person in anatomical position and you just see those planes, it gives the temptation that objects, oh, if something goes up and down, that must be frontal plane. Oh, if something goes side to side, that must be, because some people, and it's not your fault, it's just how you were taught. Some people may see linear motion parallel to those slices in space and, and say plane. And, and a lot of this gets confusing in the medical terms because you can give frontal views and transverse views, transverse slices, and you're looking at a still picture. But the concept is of a plane is a dimension of spin, okay, for human movement, okay? There's nothing in the world that says you can't use the same word to mean different things, but it has to be context. If we slice through the arm, we can see a transverse cut through the arm. Transverse slice, spin, okay? So we have to make sure we understand that objects rotate in planes. Objects do not translate in planes. I think I use, let me give one more example before I move on, because this is a very important concept. Baseball. It is not moving in a plane. It is not moving in a plane. I, I feel like this is a Dr. Seuss book. It is not moving in a plane. It is not moving down in Spain. It is not moving here or there. It is not moving in my underwear. Stop. Not moving in a plane. Nope. Nope. Yep. 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 Objects rotate in planes, okay? Another way to look at it, God, I need to stop hitting my cable. Another way to look at, at the concept of how objects can only rotate in planes is, is that if I had an object and I moved it up, just straight up, well, look, I have two planes that kind of go up and down, sagittal and frontal. So, what, what is it? Is it sagittal? Is it frontal? They both go up and down. All right, Campbell, you got me on that one. What, what about another example? What about side to side? You're like, oh, well, that's easy. That's transverse. Is it? Look at the frontal plane. The frontal plane goes side to side. Sagittal doesn't. Sagittal goes front to back. But guess what? The transverse plane also goes front to back. So any way you shift something, it could be two of these, which makes z two minus two sense. It makes zero sense. The only way to make this make sense is to spin it. This must be sagittal spin because it's occurring about a bilateral axis. This must be frontal spin because it's occurring about an AP axis. AP, frontal spin. 
bilateral sagittal spin. Polar transverse spin. Okay. All right. Hopefully that helps you master and develop those concepts of planes and axes. And now we're going to move on. We're not going to move on to a new topic. We're going to move on to applying them uh, in a different way. My class is like a staircase. So you think about stairs, right? And every step you take is made up of a step that was before it. So in other words, the first step you take technically exists way over here because the second one builds upon it, the third one builds upon it, the fourth one. So as you go up the stairs, it's kind of weird to think about it, but it's also kind of cool to think about it. As you go up the stairs, you don't leave those steps behind. They are there supporting every step on top of it till you get to your goal at the top. And that's what my class is. I build upon concepts. It's not like some classes that are like, okay, we learned the 10 steps of this. Now let's go on to something totally new. Uh-uh. These things build upon themselves, which means they're extremely important. When we start to get into complex motion up here on the staircase, planes and axes is still there. It's still there. It doesn't go anywhere. We just build upon it. We build upon those foundations until we get to the end. Okay? So we have to, we can't just say, ah, I don't quite get it. I'll move on and learn other stuff. We got to get it. And, and this is where I can help. If you need help to get it, let me know. Okay? So let's go to my guy real quick. Sagittal plane, transverse plane. I couldn't draw frontal. But again, we got to spin the dude. Spin him in the transverse. Spin him in the frontal. Spin him in the sagittal. Okay? Looks like some kind of Blair Witch symbol. I did my best. All right. So this guy would be in anatomical position. Now let's talk about anatomical position. I'm going to give you some some examples of why it's important and uh, different ways to look at it. I like to think of every joint that you have as being a member of a family. It's true. Your 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 body is house. I am house Brian, and in my house, I have different people who live in my house. You know, my skin is kind of the, the, the house and my joints, all different kind of people. You know, you got little piggies, wee, 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 all the way home. You got all kinds of different people that, that, that live in your house. Anatomical position. Now, at any given time, those people could be all over the place. You know, some are visiting friends down the street. Some are going here. Some are going there. Some are going to play at the park. But when you make a call and say, guys, get home, I need you home, hurricane's coming, everybody get home, that's what anatomical position is. It's when everyone lines up and they are home, they are in their home position. Why is a home position important? That's a good question. It's for communication. If someone asked you for directions, they said, uh, hey, come meet me. Uh, we are about to play some volleyball. And uh, we know you like to play volleyball. Why don't you come meet us, play some ball? And you say, sure, man, I'm free. I'm down. How do I get there? Well, before you give them directions, you got to know a very important piece of information. Where are you at? Where are you? Where are you at? Because before you can tell someone where to go, you got to know their position. You got to know where they're at. Guys, that's the essence of anatomical position. It's a universal starting position for our joints so that we can discuss where are you at? Where are you going? Where do you need to go to go back home? Where are you at from home? It's a home base. It's a universal starting position. We have this in mechanics as well, uh, from the horizon, zero degrees. So that way we can 
do angles relative. We, get, we have a starting place, 45 degrees from the horizon, 90 degrees from the horizon. You've got to kind of have a universal starting base. So that's what anatomical position is. You guys have heard of anatomical position, right? Palms facing forward, which you're like, well, why palms facing forward? Well, it's so that way the back part, your dorsum, is consistent throughout your whole upper body. The back part of your hand is facing the same as the back part of your head and the back part of your back and the back part of your booty. The only curve ball is your feet. Your feet are different because we are different, but we'll get to that when we get to joint motions of the, of the ankle, okay? Anatomical position, that's a starting place. That's a home base that we can base descriptive position and motion off of. If we didn't have a universal starting position, it would be hard to say what's normal range of motion or uh, it hurts when I have uh, 30 degrees of flexion. 30 degrees of flexion from where? 30 degrees from here, 30 degrees from there, 30 degrees from here, 30, where, so from where? We have to have a universal starting position. Uh, 30 degrees of flexion from anatomical position of the wrist. Ah, now I can communicate. Well, if I'm home and then I do 30 degrees of flexion, ah, that's where the pain is. It's a universal starting position, okay? Now, another position, we have two main positions. Maybe you didn't know about the second one. Maybe you did. Anatomical position is just one universal position. Now, it's a universal starting position, yes. But there's another universal position. And it's very important. And it's going to unlock a lot of our conversations moving forward. I have dyslexia, so don't tease me if I spelled this wrong. Fetal. The fetal position. And think about what's consistent. Anatomical position is like a whole body position. Not literally, it's the sum total of all the different parts. When everybody lines up, when all the kids go home. Fetal position is a universal body position of defense. Getting into a ball. Bringing all of your mass as close together as possible. Now you think about if somebody is in danger, fight or flight, well, if something's coming at you and you are going to try to protect your young one, you are going to get them into a ball and you are going to encapsulate your body around them. And it makes sense. If things are flying around that can hurt you, you don't want to have a lot of surface area. You know, if things are whizzing by and could, could, could hit you, you don't want to be like, you want to get into a ball, fetal position. It's the most dense position that you can get your body in. So this is really cool. We have the start of motion here because all motion is, is change in position. That's physics. If I start in Lafayette and I end up in Lake Charles, I changed positions. I went from here to there. And motion is literally the change itself, the delta. To go from Lafayette to Lake Charles, I must travel west. The movement is west. And then how do I go back home? Why am I saying Lafayette's home? Because that's where this university is. It's a metaphor, home. Well. If I leave home and I'm going to Lake Charles, I'm traveling west. If I turn around to go back home, I must be traveling east. The concept of east and west is based off of position. I can be in the exact same location and yet have different motion based on how I'm changing position. In other words, if I pass Crowley on my way to Lake Charles, I'm traveling west. On my way back, if I pass Crowley, <laughs> heading back home, I'm traveling east. But yet, I was in Crowley both times. Same exact concept with joints. Changing position. 
motion of the joints is literally changing position. So we have these two big positions in our body. We have anatomical and we have fetal. Fetal and anatomical, the roads that all the different joints. Can my fingers help get me into a ball? Heck yeah. Can my wrists help get me into a ball? You know it. Can my elbows help get me into the ball? Yeah. Uh -huh. What about my shoulders? Yep. My cervical, my trunk, my hips. You got a lot of things that can help get you into a ball. And the road that all of these different joints travel in to get you into fetal position is the sagittal road. They all take the sagittal. And this is what's really cool. You can be in all kinds of different crazy positions. You could be looking to your left. And if there's danger, you're going to call everybody back home. And then you're going to move down the sagittal road. Now, of course, you're not going to be like, ah, and then move. But it's the concept that it doesn't matter where you're at. When you need to get into a ball, you're going to be eventually in the sagittal. You're going to move in the sagittal. What is the motion? I just said Lafayette to Lake Charles traveling west, Lake Charles to Lafayette traveling east. The motion of the change in position from anatomical to fetal is flexion. That's what flexion means, moving to fetal position. Now, it doesn't have to be every joint, every body. My fingers have flexion because as I move in the direction of flexion, I get more into a ball. Flexion. And that's why you have so many things that flex. Your cervical flexes, your shoulder flexes, your elbow flexes, your wrist flexes, your fingers flex. You got a lot of things for flexion. And that's why. Getting you into a ball, getting you in a fetal. So the road from anatomical position to fetal position, the road is the sagittal plane. Sagittal plane. And going from anatomical to fetal is flexion. So if I go west, what's the opposite of west? East. West, leaving home. East, going home. Now, of course, this is just this analogy. If I started in Lafayette and went to Baton Rouge, east would be leaving home and west would be coming back home. It's an analogy. But the opposite in this case of leaving home and coming home, what is the opposite of flexion? Extension. Flexion and extension or motions that occur in your sagittal plane, the joint sagittal plane. Now, can my elbow flex and extend and maybe I don't get into pure ball? Yeah, maybe my shoulder is externally rotated and my flexion extension is over here. It's the concept that this is more of a ball of my mass than this. The elbow has no clue what else is happening over here. The elbow just knows, oh, I need to get into a ball. And I could get into a ball like this. I could get in the ball like this. I could get in the ball like this. Elbow doesn't know what the heck's going on. Elbow just gets into a ball or does it. It shortens its mass. It brings its mass closer. We, and we have a fancy term for that in physics. Decrease the moment of inertia. Mm, nerd alert. It's just bringing your mass closer to a ball. You think about when you wake up in the morning, you're more likely to be in a fetal position. You're more likely to be in a ball. Me, I'm in a ball and I'm sucking on my thumb. But hey, that, my therapist says that's very natural. Fetal position, a crunched, tightened ball position that you get to with flexion. Extension is the opposite. Okay. Now, I'm going to introduce you to that's motion. 
specific motion. And listen, we're going to get into, we're going to get into all that. But we, I got to teach you how the game works first before we get into the more complex stuff. If you have the motion of flexion and extension, then you can have the position of being flexed or being extended. And the only way you can have those positional terms is by having a universal starting position of home base, of anatomical. What I mean by that is, let me get my uh, very expensive uh, manila folders here. Okay, here's home base, L for Lafayette. Here is Baton Rouge, and here is Lake Charles. Let me also put a little north, south, east, west. Okay. So let's talk. Before we talk, I gotta add another, I gotta add one more in there. Of course, I gotta add Crowley. And I'm gonna add Brubridge. I know it's not to scale. Nothing I ever do is to scale. So look what we got. Look what we got, north, south, east, west. Which, by the way, that's very tricky for young kids to see north, south, east, west on a chalkboard but knowing that it's actually rotated like this. So when little kids, hey man, point north and they point up, I don't blame the kid. That's not fair. They're pointing on the chalkboard. That happened. So let's check this out. Lafayette, Brobridge, Baton Rouge, Crowley, Lake Charles. Brobridge is east of Lafayette. Duh. But Brobridge is west of Baton Rouge. Er. So which is it? Is it east or is it west? It's nothing unless you give reference, unless you make it relative. It's east of Lafayette, it's west of Baton Rouge. So to permanently make it east, I need to set Lafayette as my home, my universal starting position, so that Baton, so that Brobridge is always east. That's what anatomical position is. It's so that we don't have this confusion of, well, it's east to something and it's west to something else. So let me give you a joint example of this concept. Okay. Anatomical position. Am I flexed? Am I in a flexed position? Am I in an extended position? Neither. I'm in an anatomical position. Jack. And from anatomical, I can have flexion. And this entire time, I am in a flexed position. Now, I'm more flexed here than I was here. But if you think about it, if I'm traveling east, every place I'm here is east of Lafayette. Now, if I get to Brobridge and I keep going to Baton Rouge, I'm more east, but I'm still east at Brobridge compared to Baton Rouge. You see my analogy here? Lafayette, flexion, traveling east. Brobridge, keep going, Baton Rouge. I am flexed the entire time. I am east of Lafayette. I am flexed relative to anatomical position. Flexion is the motion of changing position. Flexed is the position relative to anatomical. Let's go the other way. Extension. Okay. Extension. We're going to use west for extension. Traveling west. Extension. I get to Crowley. I keep going, I get to Lake Charles. Extension is the motion. Extended is the position 
relative to anatomical. So in other words, I am extended when I'm in Crowley. And I am also extended when I'm in Lake Charles. It's just I'm more extended when I'm in Lake Charles. I am more west when I'm in Lake Charles. And we have ways to communicate that. On a map, we do it with miles, right? Uh, Crowley is 20 miles west of Lafayette, and Lake Charles is 70 miles west of Lafayette. We do it with degrees. Um, 20 degrees of extension. I'm extended 20 degrees. That's my position relative to anatomical. I'm extended 45 degrees. Extended my position relative to anatomical. So that's how that works. Th th in normal ranges of motion, there is no such thing as hyper. Hyper is very confusing to some people, bless your hearts. And people want to default, default to flexion, extension, and then anything past anatomical is hyper. No! Hyper is excessive. Hyperventilation, excessive. Right? Hypertrophy, excessive. A hyper child, excessive energy. Hypermotion is excessive motion. It went further than what your body allowed. So you think about a hyperextended elbow. It's not supposed to go that far. Hyperflexed cervical vertebra. You can have hyperflexion. You can have hyperextension. That's beyond your normal road. It's beyond your normal range of motion. Okay. So, important concepts to understand. Position. Where are you at? For you future therapists, this is going to be extremely important working with people because you're going to be able to see things like their posture and say, man, where they're at is not where they should be. So I need to work on them to get them back home. Why? Because home is very efficient. Your body was designed to live at home. You distribute forces. When all of your stuff is lined up, it's easier to distribute forces. Uh, think about when you're holding a backpack in the front. It puts more stress on your back, right? When you redistribute force, your body has to compensate. So that's what we're getting at, is being able to see position and say, man, that, that doesn't seem right. There's something off. Leg length discrepancy, it'd be a lot of different things. But the point is, is that the best way to understand what's not right is to understand what normal is. And normal is relative. I am not normal. But if you saw someone walking, I know this is ridiculously silly. Come see Chewy. If you saw someone walking, so you know how people walk, they'll put their left leg and their right arm, and then they'll put their left arm and their right leg, right? You walk ipsilateral. You walk, and that's to help redistribute force. Um, my left leg goes out, my right arm goes out. Because my left leg wants to swing my body this way, my right arm swings to counter, it keeps me moving straight. If you saw someone walking, let me see if I could do this and be silly and educational at the same time. If you saw someone walking with the same arm and the same leg, right? So like they're walking and they're doing this. They're walking down the hall and they're like, instead of doing this and then this, they do the same leg and arm, <laughs> walking like that. You would be, your, your mind would be, whoa, that's, there's something off. And that's what we do. We're, we, 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 we pattern recognize. Biomechanists like myself pattern recognize. We, we get to see what's normal, normal, what's, what's average, so that we can compare what's not average. When, when I see a six foot seven basketball player built like a basketball player, that's not normal. And that is fascinating to me because not normal is super cool. When I see Simone Biles, the little gymnast, she's not a big gymnast. She's got to be little to be able to do all the flips and turns. That's fascinating to me. 
Not normal is cool. Not normal is interesting. Give me not normal all day. But that's really what rehab, therapy, athletic training, you're, you, you have to understand what normal is so that you can see what's not normal. Obvious deformity. <laughs> that's not normal. Okay? So, let's look at our little Chewbacca. We're going to review, right? Chewbacca is rotating his arm in Chewbacca's sagittal plane. The room, because this is the front, that's the back, that's the side, that's the side. The room says, hey, Chewbacca, I also see you rotating your shoulder in the sagittal plane. So Chewbacca and the room see the same thing. That's cool. You can see the same thing. If Chewbacca does this, sorry, Chewbacca. I was a little too rough on him. Chewbacca does this. Chewbacca still sees sagittal because his eyes moved with him. So doth the sagittal plane. Chewbacca still sees sagittal. But now the room is like, dude, you are in my frontal plane. Why? Because the room is, this is still the front of class. The AP axis of the room has not changed. Just because Chewbacca is looking to the side doesn't mean the front and the back of room changed. So who's right? They're both right. As long as you communicate perspective, reference. Chewbacca's shoulder is rotating in the room's frontal plane. But Chewbacca's shoulder is rotating in Chewbacca's sagittal. That's okay. Right? What if Chewbacca does this? Arr, arr. Arr, arr. Rooms transverse, still Chewbacca's sagittal. Okay? So, thanks, Chewie. Global references. Global references are fixed. They do not move. In a classroom, I can set sagittal frontal. In the real world, the only thing that's really going to be set is transverse. Okay? Why are global references important? Global references and understanding global references are extremely important so that you can extract local references because joints move from a local reference. I need to be able to teach you that this is the same as this. I'm going to get there on the next lecture. From here to there, this change in position is the same as this change in position. And it's freaky if you do global, because global, you're like, whoa, this spun that way. But yet in the other one, this segment spun the other way. How can they be the same? And I'm going to use analogies, and I'm going to say the motion for me to get water out of this is open. That's the motion, open or close. And I can open this by spinning the cap this way, but I can also open it by keeping the cap fixed and spinning the bottle the other way. Cap spins like this, bottle spins like that, and I get the same thing. Okay? But if you if you if you don't understand that joints move locally and not globally, that could be very confusing to you. If you go by global references, all you want to do is, is stay true to clockwise or counterclockwise. If it's this, it's that. If it's this, that's not how it works. I'll give you one more analogy before I, I hang up. Double doors, right? You have two double doors, and the function or the motion of the double doors is to open or to close. Open, close. That's the motion. Open the doors, close the doors. The change in position is to either open or close. Well, guess what? Globally, the double doors move in two different global directions, Jack. They're spinning two different ways, but yet they have the same motion. Open, closed. We see this in the body all the time. Two different global directions of spin, but yet we call this the same joint motion. Why? Because it's locally based and not globally based. 
All right. I hope you all enjoyed my lecture today. Uh, please let me know if I need to clarify anything. Again, I have a 24-hour uh, uh, policy for uh, office hours. We can talk. We can FaceTime. We can Zoom, Zoom, Bolt. Do whatever we need to make sure you're on the same page, okay? You guys stay safe. Bye-bye.